All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Lloyd. I am the science and engineering curriculum liaison and an I teacher in Worcester Public Schools. Today, Michelle and I are going to be doing um, academic vocabulary with you. So different ways to engage students in vocabulary um, to get them to be really better at literacy, right? And better at understanding your content area, no matter what it is. Uh, Michelle, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi. Um, so I'm also an I teacher in the Worcester Public Schools, which is um, a set of teachers who've all gotten certified as as Google trainers, and we know other technologies as well. And we're training other teachers in our district. Um, I'm a middle school ESL teacher. Okay. So our objective for today: participants will learn how to use online resources and Google tools to efficiently target, teach, and reinforce high utility vocabulary terms as they naturally appear in context. And that's key, high utility. So our agenda, we're gonna be going through four different tools or four different strategies today. The first one is multilingual, sorry, multi-language translation. Then we're gonna get into an academic vocabulary tool from there, some graphic matrix ideas using a Frere model. And then finally, some verbal or oral speaking tools. Uh, Michelle made sure we put that one in, especially in remote learning. We want to hear more of our kids' voices. And that is definitely something that's missing in this um, arena. OK, so uh, three or four years ago, I walked into my ESL 1 class. and. On the first day of school, I had nine languages represented in my class, nine. And I thought, how am I going to do this? Because I had been using Google Translate, but I had mostly Spanish and Portuguese students, so I could handle it. Came home and I thought, there must be a multi-language translation tool. There must be. I spent like three hours Googling it, couldn't find it. And then I, I thought and I said, well, Google owns all of that code. There must be some way to write a script to do it in a, um, you know, a formula to do it in a Google Sheet. So I'm not clever enough to actually write that formula, but I put my query out onto a, a Google Sheets help board and within three hours, a guy in India wrote it out and gave it to me. And so I now have this tool. So let me, um, this is a, a demonstration. So uh, you'll get a copy of this, obviously. So see, it says smartphone and then it automatically puts it in all the other languages. Teens say, hooked on, um, addicted to. So I think we were doing something about being addicted to our smartphones. So this multi-language translation tool is so powerful. When you have kids who are literate in their home language, yes. and so that is key. It has to be literate in their own language and it has to be, so like some kid who has, like learning difficulties, they might not be a good reader in their own language, or if they've had interrupted education, or there are some languages that are just not in Google Translate. A lot of the African languages, for example, we have kids who speak tree and ga, and those are not in Google Translate, but for world languages it works pretty well. So I use it for glossaries and Gloss, it's so much better for a teacher to make a glossary for kids than say just look up the words you don't know or translate everything because you can decide what's the most important, the key words that kids need to know. Um, you do have to be careful about multiple meaning words. So if you look at this picture, tap water or tap on the desk, right, or tree bark or a dog barks. So if if in your glossaries, you put a little extra word there to tell Google Translate which, which version of the word you mean, it helps. Um, also, um, also parts of speech, like nouns versus verbs that are the same. If you do something as simple as a cook or to cook or to watch or a watch, and with newcomers, if I am doing a verb that's an irregular verb, I always just put all three tenses in there because why, why not? Um, so it's good for collocations, parts of speech, verb tenses. Uh, we're not gonna do it here, but you can change the languages. We're gonna give you a tool uh, or a link to this multi-language translation tool. 
And if it says click here for a copy of the trail with examples and complete instructions, there's a video that shows you how to change languages. So here's what I use this for. Instructions, you can use the horizontal tab and paste it into slide, docs, or chat. My do nows, um, just putting the instruction in another language for kids, especially when they're, they're new and they don't know your procedures, it helps, glossaries. Now with remote learning, when I have my newcomers, the kids who don't speak English very well, I keep an open sheet off my screen. And when somebody asks me a question in the chat, I just write the answer in English and then I paste it. This year I only have Spanish and Portuguese. Um, I just paste it in the chat. So I'm putting all three languages in the chat. And then this original, any language, it doesn't actually have to be English. The kid could put something in it and it can go down to everybody. So Michelle, can I interrupt you for a moment? Sure. Yeah. Um, so people are wondering, how do I get this? At the end of this presentation, we are giving you this slide deck. Now, I didn't want to give it to you right now because then we only have 45 minutes and people would be playing with it and then we wouldn't have time to make you aware of some other things. So never fear. At the end of this presentation, you will get a forced copy that will give this to you and feel free to share it with anybody, right? Michelle, if there's yes. a language on there that I have students in my class that maybe have a different language, are there instructions in this link on how to change to different languages? Yes, so let me back up. I, we're gonna give you this multi-language translation tool, HyperDoc. It's at, on the end of our slide deck, it has this. And it says, click here to make a copy of a Google Sheet you can modify to use with any languages. And then down in the bottom left, it says, click here for a copy of the multilingual multi-language trans translator tool with examples and complete instructions. Okay. And there's a link to a video that shows you how to change the languages. So that's beyond the scope of this very brief introduction to it, but it's pretty easy. Basically, there's just a code. Um, and all you have to do is replace a two or three digit or two or three letter code for one language with another. So like I, one year I had a kid from um, Haiti and on my paperwork, it said she spoke Haitian Creole and she got here and she said, miss, I went to a private school. All my, I only ever went to school in French. I want French. And so I just translated Haitian, changed Haitian Creole to French. It's Perfect. easy to do. Okay, so let's take a minute. Um, you can see on your pair deck that you can drag an icon. Oh, I'm sorry, Christine, you go ahead. I apologize. No, that's fine. So while I explain kind of how to use this, um, we also had another question, which is a great one from Sydney. And she wanted to know, have you found that the translations are all fairly accurate? You know, five years ago, I would say that they were sometimes really goofy but it gets better and better and better. There are some things that you can do to make it as good as possible. Like, especially when you're communicating with parents, short sentences and don't use slang and idioms sometimes get a little weird. Mm -hmm. But these days I have found even idioms translate into the equivalent idiom in the other language. It's getting better and better. So I would say that the, the result is like good enough to understand. So I think it, some, it some, some advice we usually give, right? Is that if it's just communication home, like they need to do their homework, they're late for class, please have them study this, it's great. If it's more for an IEP, a 504 or some legal jargon, that I would go to your district and ask for the official translation. Is that fair, Michelle? Yes. Yeah. So um, with communication with parents, Machine translation is for ordinary things. Correct. And for something really critical, you can uh, bring in translators. But I'll tell you what, you know how middle school girls get into drama? One year I had three girls who were all mad at each other. I don't even understand how they were mad at each other because they can't even speak the same language. But we had Arabic, Haitian Creole, and Spanish. 
And we used Google Translate. Actually, we used the one on the phone, but it's the same deal. We used Google Translate to mediate a problem. I mean, it was pretty good. Mm -hmm. So coming back to the slide that you have on your Pear Deck, the multi-language translation tool, what we're asking you to do is kind of rate the usability. How likely are you to use this in your teaching? And then um, how likely are you to share this with a colleague? I know that when I look at new tools, before I start really diving into how to use them, those are the first two questions I ask myself. Am I actually going to use this regularly in my teaching practice? And am I going to share it with someone? Um, we know nowadays that there are so many tools out there that those are you know, some of the two key questions you can ask yourself before getting uh, more training or learning how to use something. It looks like everyone likes it. That's great. Most people are saying, yeah, I would use this. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's some people that don't have a need for it mm -hmm. in some districts, but, um, and, and again, it has to be literate newcomers. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. So now we're moving to academic vocabulary. So this little picture here represents something I actually heard a few years ago. I was proctoring MCAS and it's silent. And a boy broke the silence by saying, shoot, except he didn't say shoot, he said the other word. And he said, what does analyze mean? And then the whole class started saying, yeah, miss, what does analyze mean? I don't know what analyze means. What does, it's fifth graders, what does analyze mean? I'm like, just do your best, just do your best, just do your best. <laughs> and in my brain, I'm thinking, yeah, my ESL class, we just broke down the word analyze last week, hoorah. And then it came time for my seventh or for my um, ESL class and the kids all, actually these were not fifth graders, they were seventh graders, but they came in and they said, miss, 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 the word analyze was on MCAS and nobody else knew it and we did. And you know, all of those girls passed MCAS that year, they all scored proficient. So academic vocabulary is a particular source of difficulty for students who struggle with reading comprehension. It's, um, you know, the tier two words and very often, these are words that are not, like you think they're not critical for your content area, so you don't teach them. And the strong readers just figure them out on their own, but you have this whole group from you know, the top 25% to the bottom that aren't getting key concepts because they don't have the academic vocabulary. And the only way that you can get kids to know vocabulary is to have multiple rich interactions with it. They say that um, kids need to have a, a rich interaction with a word anytime for any amount of from five times to 20 times. Or if it's agriculture and your kids are urban 150 times. You know, like there are some words that people just need to hear again and again and again. And so what I do in my teaching um, is I'm always trying to concentrate on the academic word list, um, or sorry, academic vocabulary. A few years ago, I was at a conference and somebody talked about the academic word list. And I thought, wow, this is such a good way to target vocabulary. So there's a linguist in New Zealand named uh, Professor Coxhead who did a data dump of all kinds of secondary and college textbooks across the English speaking world, the US, Canada, Britain, um, Australia, New Zealand. And she came up with 570 word families that does not include the 2000 most common words. Now, this list is really powerful. Approximately 10% of the vocabulary in academic nonfiction text is the academic word list compared to only 1.4 of the words in fiction text. So you really need to be interacting with nonfiction text um, in order to be exposed to these words. So right now I'm gonna, shoot, it's not letting me click on it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Can you guys click on it? Note to self, put this, Chris. Um, I'll put, you want me to put it in the chat? Yeah. Yep. Not a problem. So right now my presenting thing is like not letting me click on this link. So any link that I need to click on, yeah, you can click on it, but I can't because my presenting bar is so there. I just put it in the chat for you. Okay, thank you. So this list, I mean, if you look at these words, 
Um, the words in sublist one are the most common. The words in sublist two are still common all the way to 10, which are still good words, but they're you know somewhat less common than one. So a few years ago, I tested, how am I doing on time? I'm running out of time. No, you're fine. You have 10 more minutes. You're totally fine. Okay. Um, a few years ago, I, I tested ESL students for several years on their recognition of the um, sublist one on the academic word list. And I found that long-term English learners, the kids who are still in ESL in middle school, they tended to know they had a mean recognition of 55% of those words. And then, you know, I was wondering, well, how do the high functioning kids, or not high functioning, but you know, the, the more academically successful kids do. So one day the, the math teacher was gone and I took the, the um, I stole the honors math kids and I paid with them with Doritos and said, <laughs> hey, can you take this test for me? No, you're not supposed to, but I did. And all of the honors kids finished this quiz of 30 questions in like eight minutes and got 100% of them right. Successful secondary students know a lot of these words. And just teaching these words and making sure that people know about them can make an enormous difference for kids. So this list is great, but we don't all want to be looking, looking, looking all the time. Yeah, I don't have time for that, Michelle. I don't have time for that. <laughs> so there's this guy in China, an Amer like some um, New Zealander or Australian or something, British, I think. This guy who teaches English in China who has um, something called, that he calls the AWL highlighter. And look at this, this is a video, okay? So I pasted, oops, sorry, sorry. So I pasted text, you know, like copy text from an article and then I pasted it into, so I copied that, then I pasted it into the academic highlighter. I hit paste, I do submit. And it shows me all the words that are in that article and it sorts them out by sublist. So in middle school, I find that a lot of the kids know most of the words on sublist one, but if there's a word that they don't know, I need to make sure that everybody knows that word. And we sort of work our way down. So let me show you one more time. So it pastes, paste it in there. So what you're telling me that this AWL highlighter tool is actually using that academic word list research. Yes, exactly. So it's using that list that we just showed you and it's automatically pulling out any form of the word in, in the word families. I like how you could also just copy the pictures too and it didn't even mind, right? It didn't even mind, it's so fast. So every single time I am preparing any lesson even if I'm not going to do an academic word list thing, I always copy and paste the text. I have the academic word highlighter. Can you guys see my um, bookmarks? Yes. So I have the AWL highlighter right here in an important place on my bookmark. I paste everything in it. So all things being equal, pick the first words on the list that many students are unlikely to have already mastered. So obviously we're not going to do all of these words, but I might pick three or some, sometimes I might pick five. I'm never going to pick 20 um, for, a, for direct instruction. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a similar tool, which um, I don't use, but it, it helps you target tier two vocabulary by grade level. So this is the academic word finder from Achieve the Core. And one thing that I love is this little W is um, the logo for a program called Wordsmith. And so the academic word finder takes, it's the same thing, like you take um, some text and you paste text into it. So you insert your text, you paste some text that you have. So this is about Malala, for example and you paste your text there, you select a grade. So this is better for elementary school students, I would say, or elementary school teachers, I would say. And then, you know, you have to like label it. Um, and then you hit this and it gives you tier two words by 
by grade level. So when we look here, so they have accord, nationalize, reduction, uh, consider, recognition, exhibit, and then they give you a bunch of definitions and examples right there. So you can just like paste them into what you're working with, decide which one is closest to what you need. So I would say that the academic word finder has a lot of the same functions, which is helping you efficiently target vocabulary because we are too busy to be spending so much time. But if you can have really rapid ways of identifying which words to work with, you're gonna teach them more across um, any content. Michelle, we keep using yes. this word tier two vocabulary. Now I'm a science person. Are you talking about words like photosynthesis and uh, tectonic plates? Thank you, you know? Um, so tier one vocabulary is the word, and I should have said that, thank you for catching me. Uh, tier one vocabulary, are the words that everybody should know. So some English learners, need to learn them, but English, but it's like walk, smile, love, sky, you know, the words that you can expect all of your kids to know, except maybe English learners. Tier three words are the content specific vocabulary, photosynthesis, agriculture, tectonic um, plates. Tectonic plates. <laughs> so most teachers are pretty good at knowing that they need to teach the three tier, the tier three words. But what we forget is that these tier two words, which are, it's academic vocabulary that tends to occur across many different disciplines. Thank you. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. Um, so I had just pulled an article um, Copy academic, the killer flu of 1918 was the one that I pasted into the academic word list. And these are the, the words that I just wanted to make sure that kids knew. So on their do now, I asked them to copy academic vocabulary from the killer flu of 19, and then label each word with a number from the vocabulary rating scale. And this is also, this vocabulary rating scale, we're also sharing with you. Because you know how you ask kids, do you know this word? And they all say, yes. <laughs> and then you say, what does it mean? And they're like, oh, miss, I forget. <laughs> so I kind of, when I first use it, I say there are all kinds of levels of knowing. And I talk it up a little bit. But so four is I know it well. I can explain what it means. I use it. Three is I sort of know it. When I see it, I usually understand it. Two, I've seen it or heard of it, but I'm not sure I know what it means no clue, I've never heard of it. So I might do a warm up where I do some kind of thing where kids rate their vocabulary scale and then, then I decide which are the words I'm really gonna focus on. And the kids who've given you four, they have informed you that they can teach their peers this word. <laughs> and so you can make good use of that. I use this vocabulary rating scale quite often. And not in virtual learning, but in real, in like in class, I used to, just a second here. Once kids kind of knew the thing, I might pull this up, put it up on the board and say, okay guys, what three words should we learn? And they tell me in like a minute. Yeah. Oh yeah, I don't know that one. I don't know that one. Um, but like so, you said, they've probably seen them. So they do want to know what they mean. Yeah. Yeah. You that Kahoot thing. Oh no, we're gonna do the you try it now. Yeah, and then so every single word, every single word on the academic word list is a high utility word. Mm -hmm. You need them in a lot of contexts. And these words are going to help kids more than the fancy funny words that they always highlight in textbooks. In textbooks, they always put like the word that they think that nobody knows. But these words like implement, acknowledge, inadequate, required, assured, kids need to know these. Yes. So we need to find some way to quickly build in instruction on this into whatever we're teaching. Okay, so when you try it, if we were had a longer class, we would do this now, but I'm telling you that there's this slide so you can come back later. 
You can find a text online that you'd use in your teaching. Try copying and pasting the text into the academic word highlighter and the academic word finder. These are actually hyperlinks right here. So, so you can click on that and, and at the, the slide has that at the end. And then analyze the results and which five words would you teach? So if you can turn that into a super quick routine as you set down to plan your lessons, it is going to make your instruction more robust for sure without killing you. And then um, this is just another thing that I'm kind of telling you exists. There's a program called Wordsmith with a Y, wordsmith.net. And I take words and I put it into wordsmith.net and they give me these great multiple choice quizzes and then I just put them into Kahoot. So for my whole, for years, I have had Friday is game day. We play cahoots on Friday, but actually what they are is vocabulary, vocabulary quizzes with the words I've taught them. Um, and by using some of these tools, the wordsmith gives me my questions and then I can make the cahoot very quickly instead of having, yeah. Ben, sorry. So that was pretty fast. What time are we at? No, nope, we're so go ahead to that next slide, the uh, the rating scale. We're good. Yeah. So you can talk, Christine. All right. So what you're gonna do now is again, same idea, right? This academic word highlighter and the academic word finder rate the usability. How likely are you to use it? And how likely are you to share it? We know Ben is sharing. I love that. Thank you, Ben. And again, make sure you share with everyone because this is not just for ELA teachers, right? As a science teacher, I, it changed the way I taught my academic vocabulary, having these tools available to me so that I wasn't just focusing on those content heavy words, which is key. All right, are we ready to see what they said? Yeah, let's see what they said. Great, looks like most people yeah, are finding these tools useful and ready to share them. Yep, and you know what? I, I am lazy. I like things that make my planning take less time. Actually, that's not, a, that's a lie. I spend so much time. I spend so much time planning, but if you can automate some of the things that would take time, then you have more brain power for feedback. the creation. Quality feedback. That's what we want. Quality feedback. Yep. Okay. Now so, I'm going to pass it off to Christine. Thanks, Michelle. So we've kind of shown you ways to be able to translate and make vocabulary accessible to our students if English language is not their strongest. And we've shown you ways to kind of figure out which words to teach in your practice. And so the next two things we're going to show you are how then to teach this vocabulary. So some tools to actually do the teaching of the vocabulary. The first thing um, we're going to do is really just a frere model. Um, and it's modified because we took out some of the pieces. So we're going to do an intro and then we're going to have you do this. All right, let's go. So the Frere model, if you don't know, it's just a graphic organizer um, for building student vocabulary. I called it word art for the longest time. That's just what I called it in my classroom. And when I said we were going to do word art, the kids knew what it meant. I've heard it called Foursquare. I'm sure you've heard multiple names for this tool. Um, what we've done is modified it because we took out that non-example slash examples and really just focused on using it in context, in this case, a sentence, having some kind of graphic or image associated to it, and then having the students write the definition in their own words. And we know as teachers, that's usually the hardest part. Where I find the Frere model helpful is on that piece. So for science, if I'm doing the word property, and I have a student who comes in with a Frere model and they say the piece of land that I own, I know that they are not using it in the correct context since we can have that conversation. There is a link there if you're interested in some research behind Frere models and academic vocabulary um, that you can look at on your own time. All right, go ahead, Michelle. Okay. So again, here are some examples of um, word art four square, four square Frere models. Some of you may look at them and say they seem familiar. What we're gonna do is have you practice one that we can use remotely. So a digital version. Although I will say having kids use paper and pencil in your remote classrooms, um, if you are in remote is still recommended highly. All right, go ahead. 
Okay. So we are going. Oh, I can't get the link just a second here. That's okay. I'll get it. I'll put it in the chat. Okay. So, so um, this is what I didn't realize is that um, this works very well when I'm doing um, Google Meet, but in Zoom, it's hiding my access to the link. No problem. I've got it. Thank you. So, I'm putting the link in the chat now, and I'm going to ask everyone to go ahead over to that Google slide there. And I've made quite a few copies of the slide. I'm going to ask you not to type on slide one. So I'm going to do the typing on slide one. And I will give you instructions on how I'd like you to type on the other ones. So let me get in. And can you see this on my screen sharing? Yes. Yep. I see just about, I'm going to give everyone a few more minutes to get in there. It looks like we have about 21 folks. That's perfect. So here I am, I'm in slide one, and I'm going to show you how I would use this um, as a teacher, as a student. So in the center, the teacher would go ahead or the student rather and type the word. So I'm going to use the word producer. And you can see I'm typing that right in. It tells me I'm typing. I would have the student um, write or type the definition that I gave them. And so this might be an organism that takes energy, sorry about my spelling, directly from the sun. And this is important because I do want them to have that definition there. I don't want to hide that from them. Transparency is key when you're doing vocabulary instruction. We don't want to take anything away from them until they're ready to use the word on their own. So they would then go ahead and type a sentence using the word. So the producer in this ecosystem is the palm tree. And then of course, write their own definition. Now what's great about the Frere model, what I love is this visual representation. So Michelle's gonna do this for me because if I did it on my page, you would not be able to see. So Michelle, can you say insert image? Yes, I can. So I am going to go to insert image and they have a bunch of different options. So if you had something in your drive already or you had something on your computer, but what we're gonna tell the kids to do is search the web and what I love, especially for our youngest, is that this keeps them right in the same window, right? That's a great feature of slides, if you didn't know that. So go ahead, search the web. Search the web. Now, would you type in the word producer for me? Oh, yeah. And I'm, I'm guessing that it'll have something to do with Hollywood. And oh, I'm like, yeah. Like, <laughs> so like if you producer. were to choose this word, right, that tells me that they do not understand this definition yet, right? It's a key indicator for me. So they have to be able to do what Michelle was talking about in that first tool that she explained is kind of put in a context clue there. They have to understand what this word means in order to find the right image. And so hopefully I would say producer plant. So let's try that. And now we have our images. So go ahead and choose which one you like best. So Maisha, yes, this will work in PowerPoint. However, PowerPoint, I do not believe will give you this in-window search function for an, an image, but you could still use PowerPoint to do this. Yeah, so um, we are, uh, this, this slide deck that I gave you, or that we're giving you, <coughs> you any, any of the resources, any of the graphic organizers that we have, you can download it as a PowerPoint mm -hmm. and then give it to your kids. And in fact, I created them in PowerPoint. So I want to show you one more thing before I ask you to go ahead and spend a couple minutes playing is one of the things that Michelle has done, which is great with the slide deck, is that she's made it so that you know how kids want to like choose their own colors, but it takes them hours to figure it out. She's created different backgrounds, so or layouts. I always do this. So do you want to go to layout? Yep. Slide, apply layout. And so now the kids get to pick like one of these color options to choose from instead of having like, you know, an, an infinite amount of colors to choose from and change. And I always, when I'm giving kids options, I always give one that's just black and white because you have a few kids that the color is distracting to them. So, so what, I, what I'd like you to do now is go ahead and choose a slide that no one's on. So you so might you know, start down from the bottom. So everyone choose their own slide. And I'm going to give you um, 
two minutes to go ahead and pick your own vocabulary word and just try using the tool and see if you can use the slide deck. Try changing the layout. If you have questions, throw them in the chat right there. So for the second graders, I will say this. Um, if it is on an iPad, it is very difficult to resize an image. However, I have seen in my um, remote places that resizing the image really isn't tough for them if they have good mouse skills or good skills on their mouse pad. And that's really what it depends on. If you're worried about that, what you can always do is put some pre-prepared images on the side, right? And then they just have to click and drag them into the proper image. So I might have the image of a plant and the image of an animal if I were doing this with second graders. And then they have to choose the correct picture. So definitely great modifications for this. Oops, I yes. typed an E on. So for example, I'm gonna insert this. And one thing that I really love about slides is that you can have things off the slide. Mm -hmm. Slide, insert image, upload from computer, oops. Insert image, search the web, and let's see. And again, the point of this for the vocabulary instruction is that I'm able to quickly see um, where students thinking is for a vocabulary word. Now I chose a tier three word, which is a vocabulary for academic content. You could also of course do this with tier two. All right, let's take everyone back to the Pear Deck, Michelle. Okay. So again, you'll have a copy of this to use. You'll be able to make a copy um, to use with your students. No worry, you don't have to make it on your own. Take it, make a copy and use it. Now I often, in when I, back when I had real kids in my real classroom, I might have five words that I wanted to teach today. And I might have table one work together on slot on word one, table two work on word two. So you can have kids work together on these as well. So let's keep moving forward. Yep. Um, Carolyn, yes, I can see this working with early childhood and kindergarten, but again, there are other tools that we can modify it with, which are speech tools. Padlet might be a better tool for them because you can speak right in, but I don't, I wanna make sure that we're kept on time. So when you try it, go ahead. There are the digital templates. There's also a foldable we did with kids. So it's paper, pencil, and there's a video there of how the foldable would work. So these are links here yep. and you can go to them. All right, keep going. So again, let's quickly go ahead. What do you think about the modified Frere model slash matrix four square word art? Would you be likely to use this with your students or share the template or foldable instructions? All right, let's go ahead and see what they said. Okay, we've got, yep, right. again. We're still liking the tools, that's good. Okay. So again, the last piece that we're gonna talk about is this idea of oral vocabulary practice. And this is what's really important here um, in our remote world is to get the kids talking. I, you know, I say that I have a fourth grader at home next to me and um, I don't hear his voice sometimes for three days because he has his headphones on and he's interacting with his class digitally. And so his voice isn't always heard as much as I think it would be if he were in the building. So let's go ahead and think about some ways we can get kids to use their oral vocabulary. And again, this would work remotely or non-remotely. The first strategy is chanting. Um, then we have structured sentence frames. My rule in my classroom was always no it. You may not use the word it. If you use the word it, I'm going to say, what does that mean? Because if I don't allow them to use verbally or write the word it, then they have to put in the correct vocabulary term. And that's really important when you want kids to learn vocabulary is they have to be able to use the vocabulary. Um, sometimes you can tell in your class, I would always say, uh oh, I'm talking science to you, right? And it's like I was talking a different language to them. And the last one is word cheering. So Michelle, would you wanna chant with me for a minute? We'll give them a taste sure. of what it sounds like. Yeah. All right. When I say producer, you say plant. Ready? When I say producer, you say plant. Producer. Plant. Producer. Plant. You'll notice that I'm not having her repeat the word back to me. That is key in chanting. Choral is when I say producer, she says producer, and that's for pronunciation. 
we really want them to learn this definition. And so we want them to hear that back and forth. Go ahead to the next one, next slide there. So structured sentence frames. Again, this is really for tier three vocabulary. I would make sure that I would give them sentence frames, but leave the vocabulary blank and then have the students fill in. So for example, I am a producer and I eat blank. Well, hopefully they would know that they don't eat anything, right? Or I am a consumer and I eat producers. And so the sentence frame is a great way for them to verbally use it. They only have to fill in the vocabulary word. It's kind of like sentence frames in writing, but we do it verbally. All right, go ahead, Michelle. And then this last one is word cheering. And so this is really about the whole body movement. So if I'm thinking about doing vocabulary and I want them to be able to use or say the vocabulary words, I might make it funny and say, okay, do it in a mouse voice or do it in an old woman's voice or sing it like an opera singer. And it's just about getting them to use different parts of their brain and it also engage with that vocabulary. I might say, okay, I want you to make a volcano exploding um, motion when you're saying it. You might think it wouldn't work for secondary kids, but my high school kids thought it was hilarious, right? They love, they like doing it. It was funny. It was engaging for them in the room. And so these are great ways to get your whole body involved in the vocabulary practice. All right, I ran through that really quick. Go ahead. So again, our advice is after this call, when you get the copy of the slide deck is give it a shot, choose some vocabulary words, come up with a chant or a sentence frame um, and see how it goes. All right, last rating tool. How would you use this? Would you use it or share it? Great, right? We want to use our oral vocabulary too. All right, final slide is our resources. Go ahead, Michelle. Yep, so I'm going to, I'm putting this in the chat as well. This is a forced copy link. And what is it copying to? So it, this is giving you your own copy of this slide deck. Perfect. So all the links in it as well. And all the links in it. Um, it says, feel free to share. As long as you don't make money from it, we don't care what you do with it. Share it, <laughs> like break a part of it and do it in a, in a PD in your school. Just forward it to somebody, share anything. Yes. So the, the, um, Everything that we talked about before, there are links to here. All right, and then the last slide is just our contact information. So if you wanna follow us on Twitter, if you want to have our emails, there they are. And again, you'll have a copy of this because it's in the slide deck. So we have a minute, if anyone, or two minutes, I think, we did pretty good there. If you have questions, throw them in the chat. But thank you, and I hope you have a good rest of your uh, virtual conference. This is really exciting.